Joey Porter Jr. returned to full practice on Tuesday at the Steelers training camp, but will he earn a starting job this season? And if he does, what does that do to the Steelers cornerback room? We discussed that with Brian Batko here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, on the Wednesday edition. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello, welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Brian Batko, and we are here bringing you more stuff from Steelers training camp. It's only a couple more practices left here. Wednesday and Thursday are the final days at St. Vincent College. If you haven't been out yet, get out there because it, it is a fun time. We're seeing uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, Chris. We are. We are. As much as I know fans enjoy Steelers training camp, we we enjoy training camp too. But there's a point where we'll be happy to not have to drive out for an hour every single day. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, put the uh, the turnpike bridges behind me and pick up the hot metal bridge <laughs> to get down to the UPMC Rooney Sports Complex. Exactly. But. Different, di- different travel plan there. But I want to talk about the return of Joey Porter Jr. with you, Brian, because we didn't see really – any of the secondary in the preseason game. I mean, Levi Wallace started, but they pulled him pretty quickly. It was James yeah, Pierre sure. and Luke Barku and guys like that. And so that was like the group that we saw the least of. Because Minka Fitzpatrick, Keanu Neal, Demonte Casey, all those guys didn't play. Even but Trey Norwood are- as out. Yeah, exactly. But all those guys are back now. They ended practice pretty strong. Uh, Ray noted that. Uh, in the in, in our video in our video from yesterday on Tuesday when uh, at the end of practice when they were going at it the defense was shutting down Pickens and Johnson and I mean like it wasn't like they were bad throws they were they were just on them and plastering them and they were even talking their talk at the end of practice there which kind of was a change of pace because the receivers have had quite a few good days there uh, what is your outlook on how how this secondary will shake out right now this year yeah, I mean, it's interesting. They've, they've got a lot of pieces yet again. That's kind of been a theme of this secondary the last few years. It's it's not really been a, hey, it's these four guys all the time or these five guys all the time. They've been mixing and matching, and I, I think that's going to be mostly the case again this year. I mean, you know, you start with the corner position. Yeah, you know, all the hype is around Patrick Peterson coming in as a future Hall of Famer. Joey Porter Jr., I think, has been ahead of schedule as a rookie. But, you know, I I wrote about this for this morning in our skinny post feature, you know, the different uh, little quick hitter that we put up every day during camp. Levi Wallace is Mm -hmm. he's still here and he's still going to be heard from, I think. And he had a particularly strong practice on Tuesday. He had a breakup in seven shots to start the day against Allen Robinson with Kenny Pickett throwing. And I, I think he had both of the PBUs to end practice on Deontay Johnson. And like you said, Chris, they weren't poorly thrown balls by Pickett. They were just, uh, you know, Levi Wallace was in his face, timed it perfectly, made the play. So, um, you know, he's got a little bit of, you know, humble, a humble edge to him. I talked to him Tuesday, you know, before he went out there and, uh, and obviously played to make my story a little bit better. But uh, I was like, look, man, you know, they brought in, a vet who had five picks last year with the Vikings. They used the 32nd overall pick on Joey Jr. Do you ever feel like you're a little bit underrated kind of sitting here in the middle? And I like, I think he, you know, cocked his head a little bit at that and was like, look, if anybody thinks I'm underrated, that's the outside world. Like the people here know what I can do. I make mm-hmm. plays and it's worth pointing out, you know, it's easy to forget. He had four picks. Last year, he really came on strong at the end of the season once Akella Witherspoon was down for the count. So, you know, it, does Levi Wallace play 100% of the snaps at outside corner? Maybe not, but, I mean, it's just, you know, he's a guy that I think is still going to be a significant contributor to the secondary. And, again, it just allows you to play matchups with, hey, do you want Patrick Peterson in the slot if you're playing the Bengals and you've got 11 personnel going against you all day? If you're playing the Browns or the Ravens, but you still want to play nickel defense, do you get Elijah Riley or Chandon Sullivan in there, whoever wins that battle? Um, it's it's a, a group that's kind of difficult to pin down, and I think 
all of their playing time for the most part, other than Minka Fitzpatrick, of course, is is going to fluctuate a little bit just based on the circumstances and the situation. I agree. Here was Joey Porter Jr. after practice on Tuesday as he returned to full pads and full action and getting some action out there. This was him taught when we talked with him about his return and how he feels he is coming going into the final days of training camp. How important is it for you to play some Saturday? It's important to me. Like I'm really I'm trying to get out there, a young guy, trying to see how it is in the NFL preseason. It doesn't matter. Um, but hopefully it goes that way. I really don't know yet, but we're gonna see. Do you think you get any extra time in the game just because you couldn't play the first one? Uh, that's not up to me. That's up to Coach. I really don't know. Were you able to take anything away, learn a little bit? Yeah. Obviously, Pat didn't play either. So were you guys able to kind of build a list even though you were on the sideline? Yeah, uh, getting all the calls Coach made, really getting my visual learning going on, and also telling the Pat and Levi just about route formations, route concepts, and everything like that. So it was good. Joey, so far in camp, how far do you think you've come? What do you, what do you really looking to, to work on? I feel like I've grown a lot during camp. You know, there was some bumps and bruises throughout the whole thing, but uh, at the end of the day, I take them, I win, so it was good for me. Are there parts of your game that you can see now that you couldn't see at the start of camp and things like, oh, I got to add that, I got to see this? I could catch for real. I got nice hands. You know, I always always knew that, but I stamped myself this camp with that. Does that bring some confidence to have those picks that you've had in this camp? Definitely, definitely. Every pick brings a, a boost of confidence, confidence a little bit, so every day I try to go out there and snag one or two. Is it boosted even more after I know you didn't have as many picks as you wanted in college last year? Is it kind of a reminder to be like, yeah, I, I can do this? Yeah, it was really just to uh, shut everybody else off, the outsider that didn't think I could catch. And I had to show them that I could. Uh, but it really was nothing. I always work on it every day before and after practice. So it was something that was going to happen. You mentioned your own growth throughout this camp. But how have you seen your defense, especially your room, grow from day one to now? I mean, I feel like we're all communicating. That was the biggest thing coming in. Was, there was a lot of new guys coming in, especially me. And the main thing Minka and everybody was talking about was just communicate, communication, because without communication, we can't be a great defense. Guys, a couple more here. He's got to get going. Keanu talked about that this morning, about how it's been difficult with everybody in and out of the lineup the last week or so to, to dial in that communication. Is that something you look to hone this week now that more guys are back in the lineup, including yourself? Definitely. Uh, every day we're trying to be more vocal. As a vocal defense, that's how you get a wins and get stops. So that's what we always try to hustle for. Joe, do you put pressure on yourself potentially starting week one? Because there's a little bit of a trickle-down effect of Pat Pete moving inside if you're outside. Do you think about that at all? I always come out here working to be the best guy, be, the, be, the, be CB1. But uh, really that's up to the, that's up to coach. And if he feels like I'm ready or not, and I'm just going to keep out, keep going outside, showing him that I am. So there you have it right there. Joey Porter determined to be the starter. And like, listen, like this is kind of the approach that we've heard from everybody. Broderick Jones was, was traded up for in the first round. And he's like, if I'm called upon, I'm called upon. It seems like that's a, a healthy way to approach it. But Brian, do the Steelers absolutely need Joey Porter to be ready to be outside so that they can have more flexibility with Patrick Peterson, maybe going to the slot like he was in practice. And so that it's Levi Wallace, Joey Porter Jr. And Patrick Peterson all is your top corners instead of having to throw in a Shannon Sullivan where you could have a Porter or a Peterson. No, they don't. They don't need that. And, you know, yet again, this has been an offseason in which, you know, Omar Khan and, and company have built up the roster to the point where there are no glaring holes like that, where you went into the draft and said, we don't have a starter capable player at this position. They did a nice job of that. There's obviously spots you can upgrade. There always are. But to me, Chris, if he's if they don't feel like he's ready, whether it's health related or play, you know, practice time and preseason rep time related, you can easily roll out a starting corner unit of Pat P, Levi Wallace, and re really, I think Elijah Riley and Shannon Sullivan have both showed well at times in in camp and in the preseason games. So, um, you know, neither one of them are Mike Hilton, who really by the end of his tenure here was a, a slot corner for for all situations, which is why he got paid by Cincinnati in the AFC North. But, um, you know, both of those guys, I think, can be perhaps even a better version of, of Arthur Mollette, who was the de facto slot corner and, you know, was was in there kind of in the basically what was the base nickel defense uh, on, on the early downs. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, they don't have to force him. They don't have to rush him if they don't think he's ready. I mean, I, I still tend to think he will be. And, you know, we'll, we'll see where the chips fall. Very polished interview, though, by Joey Porter Jr. He didn't, you know, didn't answer the question about his playing time. Um, right. 
it was pretty funny when he said he learned that his hands are nice and uh, you know you're starting to become a big deal when Burt Lawton is uh, the, the guy who's <laughs> presiding over your time with the media, Steelers Senior Director of Communications. So he was the the voice you heard in there saying a couple more questions. That's when you know you have hit, uh, hit Pater as a rookie when Burt is there for your interviews. No, yeah, I do get it. That's actually kind of funny. But you're right also about his hands. He has made an interception. He's right about his hands. This was something that a few people have noted about him, you know, coming into this year was that uh, the the narrative that he can't make interceptions because he only had one in his time at Penn State uh, over all his years, I think might be a misnomer because he just wasn't thrown at that much. He wasn't given a whole lot of opportunities to make those plays. And in camp, when he's been given those opportunities, He's made them. So and I think it's a confidence thing too. It's it's like a hoopler who sees the ball go through the hoop. Now all of a sudden you're feeling good, and you you know you that gets contagious. Well, not contagious because it's yourself doing it, but you know you build on that momentum. Or somebody who makes good contact, uh, you know, in golf or something, and then you you start building. So the fact that he's made those plays, that's only going to uh, increase his own confidence to do that. Uh, even we'll talk. We'll talk about who might be making plays at the linebacker position next here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post because that Chris Carter, Brian Backo coming at you on a Wednesday. But first, I want to remind you this show is brought to you by Savinas Kane and Gallucci. They're mesothelioma and asbestos lawyers with over 85 years of experience. Call them now for a free consultation to help you out. You can also call if you need a new windows and doors installation in the city of Pittsburgh. Pella's got you covered. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year round. Schedule a free and home consultation with your local Pella windows and doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give us a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. That's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, Chris Carter, Brian Batko, talking on a, talking on a Wednesday here. Uh, one thing that our colleague Jerry Dulac, who will be on the show Friday, uh, getting us ready for the next preseason game. One thing that he wrote about was how the Steelers' inside linebacker room is improving, and it's been a theme for the Steelers over the since Ryan Chazier's injury that the inside linebacker position has been rough. Now there was a a brief glimmer of hope in Devin Bush's rookie season and halfway into his second season when he was playing well when he first came into the NFL. But after his ACL, he never looked close to what he was in those days. They've tried guys like uh Miles Jack, they tried Robert Spillane, they tried who was the guy they traded for from the Browns? Avery Williamson. Avery Williams, I forgot about Avery Williamson. I was talking about the Joe uh, Schubert. Schobert, yes, that's that's mm-hmm. the guy I was thinking of. They've tried a number Mark of Mark Barron, there. Mark Barron, jeez. But this is the point. They even <laughs> tried Arthur Motes at one point. Shout out Arthur Motes, John uh, Bostick, John Bostick, and, and they've tried so many different things. But Jerry was writing. It seems like there's a sense that maybe, at least for this group of veterans, they figured something out here. Cole Holcomb, Landon Roberts, Quan Alexander, all three guys they brought in free agency this year. Brian, from what you've seen. What should be the confidence level level of Pittsburgh Steelers that linebacker won't be this big liability that it has been the past several years? Yeah, I mean, I, I hesitate to to put the cart before the horse here. I'm a little, you know, I, I kind of need to see it before I believe it. And, you know, if, if with Jerry writing that, he's obviously hearing it from people close to the team that, yeah, there's a, there's sort of a quiet confidence in that unit, even if, you know, when we ask Mike Tomlin or Omar Khan or Andy Weidel about it publicly, they sort of, you know, they, they give you the coach speak or the GM speak, but maybe behind the scenes, they are cautious, more cautiously optimistic than they want to let on when they're standing behind a podium. But for me, I, I mean, yeah, I, I've seen it so far in camp and even in the preseason, you know, we saw Quan Alexander flying around looking like a dude who was, uh, you know, playing varsity against JV a little bit in that Tampa game, which is you know what you should expect to see from somebody in uh, year eight, I believe he is. So that's all yeah. well and good. But, you know, we just rattled off all those names. Joe Schobert came here with a Pro Bowl type resume. I thought Miles Jack was looking really good in the summer before last season, and he didn't really sustain that level of play even after a hot start to the real games. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's just – defense asks so much of the inside linebackers 
very difficult position to play in today's NFL with how offensive coordinators try to scheme up mismatches, get you one on one with you know running backs who are pretty much hybrid receivers now, tight ends who can do a little bit of everything, and God forbid you get stuck on a slot court uh, or a slot receiver, you're going to have a long day. So um, you know, I think Holcomb. He, you know, he looks like he's built for really all three downs and he's embracing that so far in camp. One Tomlinism we haven't got um, running to the competition, not running away from it. <laughs> all mm. three of those guys are doing that. Holcomb, Alexander, and he landed Roberts, who I think is going to end up being a little bit more of a game plan specific or situational sub package type guy because he is so good against the run and he is so limited against the pass. But um, yeah, I mean, that that trio on balance, it, it definitely looks like an upgrade over last year to me. But I still think the big question is, uh, you know, is it good enough to kind of elevate this defense and not be a weakness, not be an Achilles heel that opposing teams attack when they know we got to stay away from 39. We got to stay away from some of these corners with sticky hands and we got to get the ball out quick when 56 and 90 are bearing down on us. One thing I wonder if it plays a, a, a good role for the Steelers, I, I think that this group that they have assembled in general here has a lot of savvy veteran players, but also guys who possess leadership qualities, even when it's not being the leader of a unit. It might be just being a good follower who can also step up as a leader if necessary. Both Cole Holcomb and Alandon Roberts have and guys who've been captains on their teams. I'm not sure if Quan Alexander has. He might as, as well. But I, I know I've seen those guys with C's on their chest. He's been, on, he's been on half the teams in the league, I think, at this point. I mean, he's a great answer for Immaculate Grid if you play that. But, no, I mean, I think that's a good point, Chris. Like, last year, you know, Robert Spillane – he certainly had a football IQ about him. And I mean, he was a scrapper. You had to respect his journey to the league as an undrafted guy, but I don't know that he had a ton of clout in that room. Right. I don't know that miles Jack, I mean, miles Jack was the most experienced and I think people certainly respected his track record and his professionalism, but I don't know that he had a big leadership role. And, you know, Devin Bush was, you know, he was kind of always the little brother of the group really from the beginning. So I, I think since Vince Williams left, they haven't, had that alpha in a way. And, you know, I think Elandon Roberts is that. I think Quan Alexander certainly has that vibe about him. He's a latecomer to this team. So, I, you know, I don't know how that dynamic will shake out. And Holcomb might be the guy who's out there the most. So, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, it's just more answers, right? It's more answers for what offenses are trying to throw at you. You get a team that wants to run it downhill and try to just – you know, three yards in a cloud of dust their way to a touchdown. Then you throw Roberts in there and tell him to hit something. Uh, you you want a team that's going to throw it around. Uh, you get Holcomb and or Alexander out there. You let them get in coverage. You have a team that thinks they can do both. Well, now you you just pick the best two out of those three uh, that, that you think are right for that game. So you, you've got to be able to, in, in the modern league and with what offenses are cooking up, you got to just have, you know, chess moves to throw back at them. And I think that's the biggest reason why you're seeing this stockpiling of depth, but also, you know, experience, talent at all three levels of the defense. I, I, I agree with you with your with your sense there. I think that one thing that, that it beyond everything else, and defending the pass is going to be important for these linebackers, at least to not just get torched in games like you mentioned. It's but, not easy to do. You're gonna be playing Lamar Jackson and Joe right. Burrow and Deshaun right. Watson, who, you know. They know what they're looking at, and they can also beat with you, beat you with their legs. So it's it's difficult. It is difficult, but I think even beyond that, this team needs to be able to stuff the run against opponents. Get games like they had in the early part of the season, where the Browns and the Eagles were able to just run all over them at, at different times. Those cannot happen this year. They need to be able to limit teams on the ground. And if these linebackers play a big role in that as, and, are, and minimize or just, or I guess, marginalize the the the, imp the impact of teams having going after them in the passing game, I think that's all you need from this linebacker group this year. This isn't a, you know, with the star power from TJ Watt to Minka Fitzpatrick to Cam Hayward to Alex Highsmith and the potential of Patrick Peterson and Joey Porter Jr., guys like that contributing with those guys, they can all be your turnover creators. But if this group stuffs the run and just isn't getting, you know, allowing up, you know, 200 passing yards a game. I, I think that the, the linebackers will be in a good position to be good for the Steelers and can be 
this sort of role, the biggest role player piece of as a position group of all the different position groups in the Steelers defense. A tackle for a loss every now and again is doesn't hurt either. Maybe even an interception. Mm-hmm. I mean, get crazy. Maybe even a forced fumble. I don't know. Just Let's get crazy, he says. Uh, but, but but to your point, that was something you didn't see. They had zero turnovers last year. Even a couple would be it would be a boost from that situation. We got to talk about one other aspect of this defense in a, in a second here, and that's who's going to start in between Larry Ogunjobi and Cam Hayward at that nose tackle. It's not as simple of as an answer as some people might think. We'll discuss that in a minute here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, Chris Carter and Brian Batko. But first, I want to remind you guys, this show is sponsored by GameTime.co. Buying tickets for your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. GameTime is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you're about to have. Download the GameTime app today, and you can book tickets for any event around you, anywhere that you can get access to. If you just found out about this event, you can get to it. GameTime is going to help you find the exclusive flash deals on tickets for anything from football games, basketball games, baseball games, concerts, comedy, theater events, anywhere near you. They're going to help you out. And the GameTime guarantee means that you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section in a row for less on a different service, GameTime will credit you 110% of the difference. Snag the tickets without the stress with GameTime. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code PITTPIT for $20 off your first purchase. Or go to their website, GameTime.co. Terms and conditions apply. Create an account and redeem code PITTPIT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, Chris Carter, Brian Batko talking all things Steelers training camp here. One more point of observations for from uh, from, from Ray here uh, on, on the camp, and that's what that Armin Watts started to take reps at nose tackle for the first team defense. Now, Brian, officially on the, the Steelers depth chart, the guy who was leading at nose tackle was – uh, Montrevious Adams, a guy that they originally brought in off the Packers practice squad a few years ago, and he's hung around. And he's kind of been like the veteran presence that's you know that, that's kind of backing up Cam Hayward and Logan Joby as vets who've been part of the Steelers. But the Steelers drafted Keanu Benton. They signed Braden Vahoko and Armin Watts. I got to say I'm a little surprised that if Armin Watts – I knew that at some point Montrevious Adams wasn't going to – someone was going to take, take some first team reps at his spot just because what I've seen in practice – um and uh and just what we've seen what we saw in the game i thought that was gonna happen but i thought it would be brayden fajoko or keanu benton who got that look before armin watts i I think brayden fajoko is a monster against the run and i think keanu benton you know i know he was banged up at the end of the last preseason game but i thought he wrecked some shop in that game yeah i mean it doesn't seem like the coaches are are feeling brayden fajoko too much as far as benton i think he's still ultimately going to be the answer there. I mean, Montrevious Adams is, he's a nice player. I, I like him in general. He was a, a port in a storm a couple years ago when they were really going through it at that spot. And he was a nice little find off of somebody's practice squad, New Orleans maybe. And he, he came in here, had some juice to him. His get off was impressive. I remember Tomlin, you know, kind of alluding to the fact that maybe they'd found something there and Hey, to some degree they did, you know, he stayed on the team all of last season and and was essentially the starting nose. I mean, we know this, this position in general is not truly a starter in 2023 with how the Steelers play defensively, but it's still there on the depth chart. And, you know, we know that come De- December and January football, you're going to be lining up more in your three, four defense and trying to shut down the run when teams don't really want to throw the ball all around the yard. So from what I've seen in in camp and especially what I saw Friday night against the Bucs, you know, Benton, I I initially thought he was going to be a rookie that they can kind of blend into the group slowly, you know, really just kind of let him get his feet wet sort of the way they did in the early days of a Cam Hayward or even a Ziggy Hood on the D-line. But, you know, I think Benton is – he might ultimately prove to be their best option there, at at least as a guy who can – occupy two blockers and allow the other guys to eat. So we'll see. I, I don't, I mean, I think Armand Watts is, is a little bit of a placeholder. He is, as Mike Tallman called him, an NFL player. Um, thank you for that literal interpretation. 
Mike, but I think what he meant is Watts has had four seasons of, you know, playing, being productive for the Vikings and then the Bears. So he's been around. Um, he's a big guy. He's he's fairly versatile. I, I ultimately don't think he's going to be playing major snaps for this team, but at least for right now, he's he does seem to be ahead of somebody like Fajoko, somebody like Jonathan Marshall, who was signed at the end of last season off the Jets practice squad. It continues to, to look like to me that the D-line is – one of the deepest groups on this roster, and it's going to be a good problem to have come cutdown day because it's you know, it'll be a tough decision, but it'll mean that they've got some some pretty good bodies up front to deal with. Now, Ray Fittipaldo, we did his fifty three man uh, roster projection uh, on Monday here on the North Shore Drive podcast, and we actually talked about this very this very subject. So, I want to get your uh, your your thoughts on on how this plays out. If you were to just look at this Steelers, this Steelers defensive line group, and you had to make a decision, hey, which def- which defensive lineman are you keeping? Who do you keep, and how many? Now, I believe Ray kept seven uh, in his in his in his fifty three man roster projection. Uh, when looking at the defensive line, he kept Cam Hayward, Ogan Jopi, Ke- Keanu Benton, uh, Loudermilk, Liao, Adams, and Watts. So he left out Fahoko on, on his list. Brian, would you change up that list at all? Was there anybody you would sub in or out? I might go for Hoko for Watts because I think, you know, you've got your your classic DN types in Loudermilk and Liao and, you know, Ogan, Joby and Hayward, are, they're both going to wear those D-tackle hats when you've got two down in nickel or dime. So, I mean, I, I think Ray's pretty much right there. But uh, again, I mean, that – that last spot's going to be up for grabs because one, yeah, there's a lot of different players you can plug into that role, but two, they could also keep six. They they could feel like they want an extra body in the secondary with somebody who can play special teams or in the wide receiver room with somebody who can play special teams, another return option, another running back, which I know Ray only had, you know, two and a half kind of with Najee Harris, Jalen Warren and Connor Hayward. So, I mean, I, I don't know. Ultimately, I mean, I think D line is a position where, yeah, I mean, you can put the pads on in practice and you can get a glimpse of what guys are doing, but you need to see it in the preseason games and and how they are faring against people in different jerseys because that's real football, that's physical, and it it just it shows flashes of what players can do, and that's why I think it's it's pretty encouraging that Benton stood out more in that setting than he has, at least to me, out at St. Vincent. Now, it'd be remiss of me if I didn't bring this up, Brian, before we get out of here. But I won the first week of preseason fantasy football. You which did. Is also you did. Important. And with Jerry and with Jerry doing the Friday show, what are we going to do? Or are we just going to have to like text each other our picks? Maybe we're going to we're going to coordinate our picks. We're both going to okay. be in the press box. So we'll we will. Handle, yeah. handle that as well. We could, we could do we could do a live draft pregame. We could do. That's what we'll do. We'll do a live draft show. Uh, but but no, but seriously, uh, it was it was actually interesting. But it, it, it's just it's it was a fun ex- fun experiment. Uh, and we could. But Marvin Leal you know. helped me out. I didn't lose because of him. No, yeah, yeah. He he helped you out. You scored with McFarlane and Pickett. Both of them scored for you. I just I the one thing that put me up was the Rudolph to uh, Calvin Baum, which was the main thing I was gambling on. There, yeah, you won by like, you won by five, and you know I don't have to do the math to let you know that those two guys <laughs> hooking up was big. I'll say this much, you know, I give you credit for winning, Chris, but I'll give you know give ourselves a pat on the back. How many touchdowns did the Steelers score in that game? Three and. Yeah. And you accounted we, for two. We, we accounted for, yeah, I accounted for two. You accounted for, you know, both halves of one. The only way I could have beaten you, you know, to field the optimal lineup essentially is if I would have gone with George Pickens as my wide receiver over, over Gunner, who, you know, thanks a lot, Gunner, for nothing. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was made, made the game a little bit more enjoyable for me. I'm watching it with family. You know, Mason hits Calvin Austin down the sideline. They're, they're like, oh, what a throw. And I'm just like, Mm, come on like it. <laughs> run run out of bounds at the one where's the flag where's the flag <laughs> run out of bounds at the one and let Naj- or, uh, let McFarland punch this in but um yes nice nicely done Chris that was a that was a top tier QB wide receiver stack by you 
Woo, there we go. We'll do that again for, for this upcoming game against against the Bills this Saturday. But before we do that, we will have a Friday episode with Jerry Dulac previewing what we expect to see as far as matchups and how things things will go. It will most likely be the most realistic of the Steelers preseason games as far as seeing more of the starters. We'll talk about more about that as that approaches. But as two more days of training camp are here, Wednesday and Thursday, our team will be on the scene at St. Vincent College. If you want to keep getting those updates, keep Subscribe right right here on the North Shore Drive podcast and the Pittsburgh Post Gazette's page. Whether you're it's on YouTube, on your favorite podcasting app, we're everywhere. Thanks again for checking us out. We'll be back on your screens and in your ears Friday, getting you ready for preseason week two with the Steelers and the Bills. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For three months of digital access to post-gazette.com at 99 cents, click the link below in the description.